Good morning. My name is Dr. Johannes Kutzer, and I'm facilitating this very exciting um, first panel discussion about future thinking and advancing the global reset dialogue. And I would like, on behalf of the World Humanitarian Forum and our panelists, Krishna, Anastasia, and Rawan, extend a warm welcome to um, our audience who are connecting from the different corners of the world. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, hear some of the excellent discussions we're going to have today. Um, 2020 and the first quarter of 21 can best be described as a moment of, dare I say, multi-dimensional crises. Let me just mention a few the ongoing global health pandemic, the economic emergency, the unemployment crisis, the spike of abuse, and the tragedy of gender-based violence, the sad reality of systemic racism, and the ensuing crisis of international cooperation. But rest assured, we will not dwell on COVID-19, but rather, with our panelists to, to ask and engage in some critical questions about how today's international order and institutions will emerge. Will they emerge worn down or broken and spent? Or will they emerge renewed from these cumulative strains and negative impacts? You will agree there is need for having a constructive discussion focusing on futures thinking and advancing the global reset dialogue. You will hear our panelists are steeped in a global commitment with a cooperative mindset towards delivering the 17 sustainable development goals while at the same time addressing our challenging global context at hand. On behalf of the World Humanitarian Forum, I am deeply honored to introduce our three panelists. Krishna Gomez, she is an impact strategist and foresight practitioner at the School of Futures. Anastasia Evgrafova, she is a trend watcher and strategist at Zor Lab, and Rawan Adankar, who is an senior associate at Quicksand. Christina, I give you the word to briefly um, introduce yourself. You have the word. Thanks, Jan Hans. My name is Krishna. You can call me Chris. I am from the Philippines and I am currently living in the Netherlands. Uh, introducing myself, I always say that I'm trained as a human rights lawyer but I never really practiced law. And with your introduction, Jan Hans, I guess my background is very relevant in the sense that I work on, around, and to prevent or respond to crisis. So my work is supporting human rights activists and social change actors in different parts of the world, especially in the global south, be able to do their work better through innovative capabilities using design thinking, futures thinking, systems design, things I never learned in law school. I worked in different countries in the world and with that I had a lot of critique in the way that social change work is done and so I've set out to help improve that in my own work and the work of activists and academics I work with. Uh, I will stop there and uh, I'll hand it over to my fellow panelists. Thank you so much, Krishna. Anastasia. Uh, my name is Anastasia Yevgrafova, and I'm from uh, Moscow, Russia. It is my honor to be here. I, like, I really feel the importance of the event. Uh, so I work as a trend watcher and strategist at Zorlab Project. And what we do, we run creative trend watching workshops where we foresight futures through the perspective of uh, culture. So what we do, we do it by means of art practices and examples of challenges that artists take to explore the diversity of uh, technology usage, ethics, aesthetics and communication. 
Uh, also, I'm consultant in the field of branding and marketing communications, and I worked for top in international companies. And uh, but in general, I define myself as a sociologist. Uh, actually, like this is my basic education, and uh, it is my attitude to work and life. So this means that I study people' behavior. I observe how I, our mindset changes and what globalization brings us. So what are the challenges? in communication and what do we need to do to stay human uh, to each other. So that's it. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Rowan, my brother, you have the word. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm a design researcher and strategist, uh, but in fact, I find myself uh, very much at the tangent or at the intersection of many of these disciplines I studied architecture and then sociology. Uh, so I very much relate with uh, what Krishna and Anastasia just spoke about. And uh, in our work, while we do several other projects in the development or commercial sector, uh, at Quicksand, I've been leading uh, a portfolio of work in the humanitarian space, uh, particularly around uh, the future of humanitarian work. Uh, and it started really with a provocation around what if humanitarian work looked very different from what it does right now, the way that when it's produced from the global south and for the people of the global south, uh, and what does that solidarity and capability look like? Uh, so we started as an interactive exhibit uh, that we produced for the Barbican Center in London. And uh, since then, uh, over several months, we've been working with several uh, international organizations, uh, big and small, in the humanitarian space in conversations where we figured that actually they needed framing around futures to have constructive conversations about change and their own future. And uh, that's what's been uh, sort of the work that I've been doing right now. Uh, we're trying to set up a humanitarian futures lab, uh, which uh, helps uh, humanitarian workers across the world uh, find the right language to have uh, conversations among themselves about the change that they want to see in the world. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'll pause here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rowan, uh, Krishna, and Anastasia. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, you see that our, our panelists brings a, a, a really broad and specialized focus. Um, Krishna from um, human rights law, um, but also design thinking, um, which is so important. And uh, as Anastasia highlighted, the importance of um, communication, effective communication and, and branding. And interestingly, um, based on the contribution of Rawan, um, how we were saying how important it is to have those critical, important value-based conversations about change and our, and our futures doesn't matter if we are a government or a humanitarian um, actor, we all um, need to communicate um, towards effective goal oriented futures. So to get this very exciting discussion um, on the road, Anastasia, if I could please ask um, you, I, I have the same question for the three of you, but if I can ask you to um, kick off our discussion. What are your actionable priorities over the coming 12 to 18 months? And um, tell us also in terms of um, how are you delivering those and what are your key, key target audiences? Anastasia. Yeah, actually, thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, our uh, laboratory uh, started a few years ago. And uh, first of all, it was uh, like aimed for a very uh, narrow audience, like probably people who are engaged into arts and uh, maybe foresight practitioners, futurologists, like people uh, maybe a little bit from science. and. Uh, um, we thought it, it would be like very like narrow, but now when we developed and we worked with cultural institutions, government institutions, uh, we are starting to go to business and we think that uh, our audience uh, can be actually like very mass audience, so everybody. 
So this is probably our main objective to bring uh, like what we do uh, to a wider audience and to start talking uh, like more simple words than we started. Uh, because uh, we uh, feel that our mission is uh, to uh, like bring uh, understanding that futures is our personal and collective responsibility. And I think this is what we all need to understand. This is what drives us. And this is like key idea, very simple uh, and complicated in the same time, like what we need to deliver. So, um, you know, um, our aim is to uh, do like more uh, workshops for uh, people so that to uh, develop such skills as uh, creative thinking. So, you know, sometimes because we are based on arts, we um, like meet uh, like some ideas that arts is not for everybody. Just like some special people understand arts and so on. But also like our important idea is that arts like is a, a great tool to uh, bring like more ideas into our mind other way than rational way, you know, because like uh, uh, there is science fiction and uh, uh, artists who uh, already understand a lot what is happening in our world in general. So uh, our aim is uh, to uh, talk more simple words and to bring uh, these uh, simple ideas to a like, very, very wide audience. So like, in short, that's it. Thank you so much, Anastasia. I'd like to come back to you um, uh, about your question where you, you, you are using um, art as an effective medium. Um, to, to deliver some key messages. And I'd like to come back to do, Rowan, if I could ask you the same question, what are your actionable priorities um, for the next 12 to 18 months? Thanks, Jan Hans. Uh, for us, uh, I must also uh, flag that it's interesting that COVID-19 had a profound impact on India uh, over the last year. Um, despite the fact that we, we saw ourselves coming down on the on, on the numbers, etc. We are in the middle of this massive surge at the moment. And it's been a really profound time for us to recognize how uh, particularly uh, patterns have been emerging from the last year in this. Firstly, around local responses, uh, around how, uh, especially in a pandemic situation, there are lockdowns, only localized sort of networks, uh, you know, are the only things that work. And, and it's really interesting to see how people self-organize uh, to organize resources, medicines, food, etc., for themselves. And, and we feel the first priority is really around uh, recognizing that these patterns exist, articulating them in ways that we start to register them, uh, you know, at par with traditional sort of ways in which we've conceived of systems uh, in this top-down sort of fashion. Uh, second one, uh, sort of priority also comes from a pattern that we see here, which is around uh, self-organization and sort of the question of the beneficiary, uh, particularly in the global south, because there is, uh, you know, in humanitarian work, often this angle of uh, sort of helping people out and, and this sort of notion of beneficence. Uh, quite contrastingly to that, before even a lot of help from anywhere in the world arrived, people were doing things themselves, right? And how do you that question to see people have enough resources and strength and capabilities to self-organize? So the second would be to also change that narrative uh, and, and to sort of empower beneficiaries to take charge of their own narrative. And the third piece linked to that is really around uh, storytelling and, and, and to think about creative ways of talking about it. And I know Krishna has, has a smile on her face because a lot of this also <laughs> Uh, is about sort of uh, connecting these dots in different parts of the world, but also identifying what are these stories for us, right? Uh, because, I mean, I felt that particularly in the past few weeks, uh, just because you constantly hear of people not being well, giving, grieving, in this moment, it's really stories of resilience that become refuge. 
uh, and they've become really powerful for us to hold on to. Uh, and very much like Anastasia was saying, you know, uh, finding creative ways of channeling this uh, in order to make meaning, not just thinking about how there are young kids right now who've not been to a school yet because they're doing it on their iPad, right? Like, what is uh, what is the future look like for them? And and to sort of explore some of those ideas of what is the story of the future that we want to tell them uh, is is things that we think are priority areas for uh, for work that we want to do through the lab. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rohan. And and Krishna, I, I'm going to throw. Um, a two-pronged question to you. Great. <laughs> to, um, of course, answer the um, your um, actionable priorities over the next 12 to 18 months, but also to build on um, what Rowan um, highlighted, and that is um, that need to change the narrative and the design of international development as we know it. Um, and, and I'd like to hear your views on that. Krishna, please. Thanks, Jan Hans. Uh, I think I will frame my response to the first part on the actionable point. Uh, in addition to design thinking and thinking about communication that I do a lot of is what Anastasia and Rohan mentioned, which is framing and communication. So I will frame it. For me, what you said about multidimensional crisis is true. We are in it, but we know that every crisis is also a huge potential for transformation. So in that framing of this huge potential for transformation, I personally have two actionable points. The first one is to radically democratize and mainstream futures thinking. And that's not something that's self-serving because that's what I do, that's what we all do in this panel, but I've, I've been saying that before the pandemic happened, but the pandemic really highlighted the huge gap that we have in, we think, in the way that we think about our strategy and the way we go about our day-to-day -day work. The work that we do in the humanitarian and social change field is often based on three, if you're a bit advanced, five-year strategy. And that short strategy is based on what we know of the present and some of what we know in the past. But these strategies will necessarily inhabit the future, their actions in the future. So why not base them on these possible futures and work backwards from there? And when I say democratize foresight, really changing the lens that we have from this short-termness to a foresight-infused lens, but not limited to experts like we would be considered. Because in fact, if we're going to have a global reset dialogue that's meaningful, we have to bring everyone on board. And any foresight process is only as good as the level of inclusivity that it has. And so no experts, meaning experts plus plus, and we can continue working in these silos. So I told you I work in human rights, right? In my work, uh, you will hear people say, oh yeah, but I work in environmental justice, that's not human rights. And I'm like, no, it is. They're all human rights. Oh, that's humanitarian aid, that's not human rights. And I'm like, no, so we're used to thinking and working in silos, we need to break those. So we need to have democratized foresight. In my own work, I do that by working with social change makers in different parts of the world and skills building and actually accompanying them and using foresight in their strategy and iterating in that, breaking things, failing, failing is great, and learning from that. The second actionable uh, thing that I have in my wish list is something that Rohan and Anastasia already mentioned and what is the second prong of your question, which is on narratives. We cannot have a dialogue when people are looking at a different future, a different narrative of the future we're working towards. And by narratives like what Rohan said, we need to highlight those stories of resilience, but also in the humanitarian and social change field, we're so good at coming up with stories of, of fear, of lack, and things going wrong. But we don't speak enough of things that can go right and the roadmap to get there. I would encourage everyone, so I'm sharing in there a link uh, for the first actionable insight, which is a guide that I actually just published to make foresight accessible to anyone who doesn't know anything about foresight. The second one, you can find it and I'll share the link, but if you Google hope-based communications, 
that's something that you can start applying in your work on how you can do narratives very differently. Instead of plastering a photo of a suffering child on your report, in fact, if you're going to look at psychology, which Anastasia is an expert on, and neuroscience, we know that if you want to win hearts and minds, you actually have to base your communications on hope. That's what opens people up, and that's what makes people empathetic and joining our cause. So those are the two actionable endpoint, uh, uh, action points. And I think I answered your question with respect to narratives. Narratives are crucial. Narratives for me are not just a matter of communications. They're a matter of power. Because narratives in society say, who wins, who loses, who gets something. The second one, um, I think that's a conversation we can have for the next round, which is how do we then transform the, the, the humanitarian field and the actors in it? There are so many. That's what I dedicate my work in, in the way we collaborate or not collaborate, in the way we think we're innovative but not really innovative, and the way that we embrace experimentation. I'll leave it there, and hopefully people can jump in on that, but I really would like us to look at in a reset, you don't necessarily know what you're going to do, where you're headed, so you need to be radically experimental. Can we fund and can we do work where you don't actually know where you're headed, but you're just doing it to try ideas? Thank you so much um, for a very broad, very rich, and, and an in-depth response from all three of you um, I would like at this stage, please, our global audience to invite you um, and to post in the chat room any questions that you would like us to. We will um, take about 20 minutes at the end of the exchange with our panelists um, to try to answer some of your questions. So please, we invite you to post in the chat room um, a question and just indicate to which panelists uh, you address your question. Um, Back to our panelists. Um, was it Winston Churchill who said that in every crisis, there is also an opportunity? Every crisis, the flip side of a crisis is an opportunity. And um, all three of you have, have rightfully said, we are in a crisis, but let's look at the opportunities. And I, I, I also want to use the narrative of, um, for those who have studied law, um, and there is an element which all of you mentioned, which is the law of culture, and that it, it's the flip side that belongs to the same coin, the rule of law. And we always say um, law is white and black. There are no gray areas. But we very often forget to include a discussion and a reflection on the law of culture, because Anastasia, you are Russian, um, Krishna, as you said, you are Filipino. Rowan, as you said, you are South African, um, Indian. And uh, we have more than 178 um, nationalities who are connected with us um, during this session. So how do we make sure when we do deal with these elements of, um, as you were saying, the, the narratives that are very often um, anchored or boxed into a specific philosophical approach, be it humanitarian, be it development. Um, and the question that I want you to ask you is, how can we then deliver in this interconnected global sphere in which we all exist? What is the role of technology then to help us to facilitate more effective exchange, value-based exchange, but also with very clear quantitative results for communities. Not for the advancement of the rich or the highly developed countries, but also that there can indeed be more equity and that we can stop with all these intellectual debates about the 17 key goals of the UN's Agenda 2030, otherwise known as the Sustainable Development Goals. How can we turn the page to stop the intellectual debates 
and move to a debate about delivery. Rowan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the first short answer is to just begin. <laughs> uh and 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 to recognize that there will be as krishna says uh you know this uh this is a murky muddy territory we don't know the answers but the first sort of you need to make the first move to step in and and get your hands and feet dirty uh we recognize some of this uh in one exchange and i'll give you maybe two examples the first one comes from having a sort of uh, presented our work at a similar platform a few months ago and then there was a future sort of community from Peru in Lima uh, that got curious about our work and then over a few weeks we set up a series of dialogues where we just exchanged uh, information and notes between what they knew about their part of the world and their key challenges and how uh, we understood our context and what futures thinking did for us and that was a really interesting exchange where uh, firstly it wasn't facilitated by an external sort of audience it was two uh, people meeting on an equal footing and sort of exchanging notes uh, and that led to a more uh, sort of seamless grounded conversation without uh, sort of an agenda a priori right that sort of rides on top of that uh, and i think uh, particularly th the internet organizations and events like this are great sort of seeding grounds for uh, conversations like this. Uh, so in case if there's anyone who'd like to reach out to any of us, please do. And I mean, it's actually these become starting points for us to have rich dialogues. Uh, the second one's been a learning that we did uh, for a project with uh, Doctors Without Borders or MSF. Uh, where uh, the international board had a few ideas that they wanted to sort of deliberate with uh, their field staff, which happens to be in over 170 countries. Uh, and that became a really interesting project because we then had to design like a short toolkit for field staff to engage with in different parts of the world. And it was a huge learning experience for us uh, to figure out how particularly things like uh, language and tone become very important. Uh, you know, what happens when you translate a piece of information from English to Spanish, uh, to French, to Portuguese, like how does, how does that translate? And like even, even conversations around who's the person who's asking the field staff for feedback, right? Uh, so the tone in which the, con the conversation is constructed, even at the ground becomes really important. And, and finally, the third piece is, uh, is, about listening carefully and i think uh, particularly anyone who has even appetite for change uh, has to begin with the appetite of like listening to the things that may be unfamiliar difficult uh, you know uh, and and respect them and and to recognize that these are people's lived experiences uh, and they're very important to sort of uh, register equanimity equanimity or whatever that word is basically like to sort of not discount people's experiences if if they come from a certain part of the world. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Rowan. Anastasia. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not uh, too deep into like humanitarian work, uh, although I would like to catch up on a few points, like which Rowan mentioned, like uh, uh, empathy and uh, cross-cultural respect which I think are like very important in establishing like any uh, action plans and any movements like which are important. Uh, and um, my point is that um, this is uh, one of uh, key points for uh, education, like uh, the skills which we need to focus in uh, our future education, yeah, which definitely needs to change. And uh, so, like cross-cultural respect and uh, emotional intelligence, and uh, like this uh, digital literacy, and we need to bring uh, like technologies to schools and universities, etc. Because if we talk about progress, technologies, futures, collaborations, but we don't have like uh, computers and like uh, teachers, uh, so we can't move in this like at all. So, and um, another um, a point which I think um, is important is um, leadership. 
so um like kind of uh like general i don't know how to like say it um like maybe there is a special uh, like word for this but i kind of call it like humanitarian leadership you know so uh, there should be some uh like um, charismatic leaders uh, who talk uh, like with uh, like respect to cultures to people who are with a human based approach and um, the, the leaders who people listen to and respect uh, because uh, why I think it's like, very important now because probably um, now after COVID we um, and during actually like this pandemics we <coughs> <clears throat> sorry we rethink uh, the role of state for example yeah we rethink uh, the role of uh, corporations and etc uh, we look deeper into ourselves and we need some kind of like uh, um, support for big ideas and we need an inspiration you know so uh, I think the leadership is also a very important point. Some people get it from like religion. Some people get it from state. Like somebody gets it from like uh, books, like, whatever. But this is what can unite us and move forward. Like, um, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Rowan, if I can just ask you to hold on to your thought, I'll loop back to you just after um, we have Krishna's contribution. Please now. Yeah, thanks to Johan. So uh, I will, on, to answer your very difficult question on values-based exchange using technology, Johans, I'm gonna let everyone in on a very simple neuroscience trick. So MRI scans of the brain have been done that show that human beings, when we think about our future selves, it, we respond as if we're thinking about a stranger. That's a very simple insight, but I think that can be a useful insight for advancing this values-based dialogue. How? It means that when we talk about the future, people are less attached to it, there are less emotions, and there's less uh, rabid responses to things they normally would disagree about. It's like a better place to start a values-based conversation because there's less attachment by people. And I think that's a gold mine on where to get started in this values-based dialogue. We're all so different. We have many different priorities, even within the humanitarian aid field. But if we start the conversation from different futures that we co-construct, from all parts of the world, then we can really have a conversation where we can, as Roman said, deeply listen and truly listen. And how do we use technology for that? Well, this is where the pandemic has really provided that opportunity, a demonstration, a demonstration of how technology can work. We all know about our misgivings about data security, data privacy, mining of data, algorithms, echo chambers, they exist, but it also highlighted how technology can democratize conversations. People with a mobile phone, not everyone has a good internet connection, but we can contribute. And there are already examples of those where ideas on something as broad and as systematic as failures of the health system. But when you welcome ideas from everywhere, not just experts, you can really come up with with examples that otherwise people in the panel would not have come up with. And that is enabled by technology. But at the same time, technology, if it exists, doesn't mean it will work out the way we want it to. The design and the barriers we build in it or that we remove from it matter a lot. How, how, is it, uh, how does it show up in someone's, like what Anastasia, men, Anastasia mentioned, in someone with, without as much access to a high speed or a certain kind of device? But technology allows all of that. Hyper collaboration is what is enabled by technology, but we should put guardrails so that it doesn't go the other direction where Truth is something that we debate on, that we go away from values and we debate just because we disagree with people. But let's start with thinking about the futures, talk from the future or different futures, 
and enable technology that we design in a very inclusive way so people can really participate. Thank you so much, Krishna. Rowan, you have the word, my friend. Thank you. Uh, it's raining outside, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm actually maybe I'm not sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, I actually just wanted to uh, chime into what Anastasia was saying. We were able to figure out like two words that or two phrases that seemed quite interesting to us, and I thought I'd share them. Uh, one was the uh, top cover uh, and how uh, leaders actually need to uh, you know provide top cover to people who work in their own teams and say that I can space uh, you know in terms of time, in terms of flexibility and so on uh, in a way that you don't feel burdened by this liability right and I'm gonna take the risk of you know actually investing in in the team trying to try out uh, stuff, which I thought was quite uh, quite fascinating. And and if more and more leaders started to provide top cover, the world look would look quite different. Uh, the second piece was around circles of care, uh, which was also quite interesting, uh, which was more community oriented and and, and very much uh, sort of corresponding to what Chris, Krishna was saying around uh, you know particularly using technology to create sort of uh, safe spaces for people to come together and exchange notes. And even when you did that, uh, like, or if you did that, it would be uh, profound. Uh, yeah, I just thought I would drop those. Uh, and maybe like just two other things that I was thinking about, uh, which I think would be sort of pertinent to talk about in this would be, and, and also to hear your reflections, would be uh, the conception of power and accountability. Uh, and uh, yeah, like often, particularly in these conversations, uh, you know, when we talk about storytelling to the point where uh, the stories are being constructed and staged, it's often great because it's pleasant. But the moment you start talking about, uh, you know, how do you start to transform systems? Often it is about uh, who is the person who's pitching? Who is it being pitched to? Uh, who is feeling empowered, who's feeling disempowered. And uh, that's, that's something that, uh, I mean, I'm particularly curious about and, and would love to know how uh, you guys sort of deal with it, uh, you know, in your day-to-day -day lives, particularly in foresight work. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I'll just pause there. Thank you, Ruan. And, and that brings me nicely to the, the World Economic Forum in 2020 revise um, what they consider to be those important soft skills uh, that uh, um, humanity requires for the future. And one of those um, two elements at the top end of the scale is creativity and critical thinking and communicating and engaging on a solutions-based approach across complex environments. And I think that leads very nicely to what Anastasia was talking about, leadership. But the fundamental importance of human-centered uh, leadership. Now, human-centered is very complex, very diverse. And you also highlighted uh, development and learning um, with technology. And here again, let's take this moment to um, celebrate a very well-known Russian um, pedagogical psychologist called Vygotsky, because his theory was all about um, students are going to learn and advance but they are highly influenced and conditioned by the social cultural context that would help them to make sense of meaning making. You all mentioned the importance of knowledge and skills, but I also think there is the conundrum, isn't it? Because we're critical thinkers and we are able to see beyond our, our village beyond our um, narrow view of the world, um, there is increased knowledge 
and a skills capacity. With the skills capacity comes power and influence. And sometimes the, you have institutions that have seen themselves as the leader slash having the monopoly of certain spheres. How do we change the dialogue and the narrative so that we can celebrate our common humanity and to work towards achieving the same goals? Or do you think we are still in this development humanitarian, for a lack of a better expression, supermarket, where there is all this um, negotiations at the price of sometimes making more victims? And as you mentioned, using the victim and those of us who say that we are we wanting to relieve human suffering and, and to provide services to, um, to victims, but we ourselves are guilty of the labels that we put on dignified individuals by putting a label of a refugee, of a displaced, of, of a rape victim. And, you know, that individual, when they're going to grow up and they move into another sphere, that is the image that is still out there. So how do we, and, and I'd like to start with you, Anastasia, how do, we, how do we change this narrative to make sure that the narrative can indeed become more human-centered and that there is a sense of true leadership that we can all display by being more culturally sensitive and in a way, how can this narrative celebrate our diversity and our differences rather than us constantly being afraid of what is different? Anastasia. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a question. <laughs> um, maybe um, I'm I'm just you know uh, while you were speaking I was uh, like trying to get um, like the main idea. Um, maybe could you please like repeat uh, it in maybe some more simple words because there are like many many uh, aspects. I, I'm thinking just what which one I should concentrate on. Anastasia, how would you how would you frame your spirit storytelling and communication campaigns to be inclusive of humanity's difference and its diversity and this rich heritage that we need to celebrate rather than being so afraid of what brings makes us so different? Yeah. Well, um, as I actually uh, told before, uh, our aim, like of our project, is to talk like more simple words and to go from like narrow audience to a more wide, wide audience. And we uh, go uh, forward through like big ideas, like uh, um, bringing people to the idea of the like uh, personal and collective responsibility for the future. So like uh, this uh, is uh, very important, and I think uh, this is already like an uh, important idea which is uh, inclusive and uh, which brings us uh, around like one thing. And when we uh, prototype the future, yeah, it it um, also um, makes stress less. You know, and uh, it is also our like one of our project's uh, objectives, which I forgot to mention uh, in the very beginning. Uh, so we want to adapt people for unexpected scenarios, and uh, why we are like so stressed, yeah, and we we say like normal, new normal, like what's happening, how we are used to it, because uh, in general. Uh, people don't think about the future, about what is coming, about what to expect. And when some scenario happened, like the first stress is just because uh, people never thought of it. Yeah. And um, so my idea is uh, when we uh, bring to people like different scenarios, when we play with them, you know, 
So uh, it's like all about like, gamification and prototyping and design thinking and like, different uh, methodologies. But when we bring people into this process, they are becoming like, more united, like less stressed, and they already um, like, bring this uh, future scenario into their life. And then somewhere when something similar happens, it, it is uh, already, um, it will be, um, people can memorize this moment of uh, being united around this scenario and it is not as stressful. So, uh, like, to, um, like, coming back to the question and please uh, like correct me if I went <laughs> far, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, like, uh, the narrative should be around, uh, like, honest communication and uh, around, um, like, bringing, um, around not uh, being afraid of bringing uh, different scenarios into our life and playing through them, going through them and bringing, like, worse scenarios, you know. Uh, because, uh, in general, it is what unites us, it is what shapes the community, it is what makes us uh, like develop the creative thinking, actually, yeah? So, uh, and without, like, uh, and also empathy and emotional intelligence and all these uh, skills which are on the top uh, in our uh, time, you know? So, so much, Anastasia. Krishna? Some yeah. of your perspectives, please. Yes, uh, I mentioned earlier this approach to narrative making called hope-based communications, right? It talks about five shifts, simple shifts. They're not that easy to do because they're ingrained in us, but they're actually simple that we can do uh, to radically change the way we speak to the communities we work with. One of those shifts is shifting from looking at the people we work with or work for as victims to seeing them as heroes whose lives need to be celebrated. It humanizes them from somebody with those labels that you mentioned, you know, as refugee, rape, uh, survivor, etc. But they are your sister. They can be like your sister, your neighbor. They have the same fundamental daily concerns as we all have. Food on the table, security, etc. So, and, and then in that uh, approach, we, uh, my, my, my colleague Thomas Coombs gives examples of how exactly you can operationalize that. But that is precisely the shift that I hear you, John Hans, are trying to make us consider or advocate for, which is from victims to heroes or at the very least survivors. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is uh, very much connected to the work that Anastasia does on a day to day basis, which to me was one of the biggest revelations in the work that I do. I started as a grassroots community organizer in the Philippines. I, because I'm immersed in the community, I know the community really well. I know their thinking, so I can speak to them. I never, for one minute, bothered to stop and actually create what in design thinking is a basic step, which is you create a very detailed profile to understand your audience or your community. And by creating that profile, you're actually not thinking of how you see your audience, but how they see themselves. You know, in, a, in all, I know the World Humanitarian Forum is not a political organization, but we know that in political conversations, in polarized societies, we label each other. We think, oh, those supporters of this politician, they're all, all homophobic, they're all xenophobic. But for sure, those people, they don't wake up in the morning and think they're xenophobic. They have very different views of themselves and our challenge is to see them not as we see them, but as they see themselves. That means practicing huge empathy and really asking questions that design thinking asks us to ask. It's walking in their shoes. What are their interests? Who are their influencers? Who are, what are the most important things that they care about? And then start from there. Only then can you achieve a true human-centered approach in the work that we do in the social change field. Thank you so much, Krishna. We have about 10 minutes left. 
So I'm going to um, uh, pass the word to Rowan, and after Rowan, um, I, I'm going to start with some of the concluding remarks. Rowan, please. No, I, I think Anastasia and Krishna said said it all in, in so so succinctly, beautifully. Yeah. I mean, in essence, like I've just come to believe like it's just very useful to pass the mic. Uh and and whatever comes out is is useful. Uh I, I also think that I mean, at least in, in day to day life there is uh there is much more than than hope. Uh uh and, and sometimes it's also like useful to just like open and make room to breathe and also for people to process grief uh, for them to process loss for them to process these things themselves you know uh, which sometimes happen in a more open environment when you just pass the mic and you just hear uh, people and everything that both of these said like really powerful wonderful things yeah thank you rowan krishna and anastasia um it, it, it's really so, so interesting um, because what all of you have said is even in this global reset, technology, design thinking, um, uh, the role of technology is so important. But let us not forget at the heart, at the center of all of this is still the human at the end of the day. It is the human that designed that gives instructions to technology, um, focusing at the, um, the takeout, the, the objective that you want to achieve. But more important, as both Anastasia and Krishna um, said and shared with us, um, part of this engagement is also to engage voluntarily, deliberately with individuals and communities with whom we don't necessarily share or agree but it's to sit around and to start engaging because what we want is that there is a focus on clear deliverable outcomes and targets um, for all of humanity um, and this is where I would like to um, very briefly and if I can start with you Johan uh, so what your role? Wow, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and and only in two minutes. Uh, I yeah, for me, I think uh, my role, the global reset, is to uh, breathe and stay afloat. Uh, to <laughs> to take care of myself enough to know that I need to take care of people around me. I think that's that's the first to like. You know, have my wits about uh, just because we get overwhelmed every now and then. Uh, I think over and above that, I think uh, I've I've come to recognize that uh, fortunately, my work, uh, my network gives me access to platforms such as this. Uh, you know, and also uh, my work in the field gives me access to communities who often just get not heard at all. And uh, my role will be that of a bridge builder. Uh, where rather than sort of, uh, yeah, like only delivering what, uh, you know, someone needs to their place, how do I build their capabilities for them to solve their own problems? Uh, and I mean, to detail that at all, I mean, it'll be many ways in that can happen, in which that can happen. So yeah, I'll just, yeah. Thank you, Rowan. Krishna. Road support. That will be my role. That has been my role. Uh, global rules I'll take. And my humble contribution there is to provide road support to all of us travelers by asking really tough questions, not because I know better, but because I contribute to the things I learned from the things I've done right, but especially from the things I've done spectacularly wrong. Uh, and when I do my accompaniment work with activists and social change makers um, in different contexts, my role is always to ask them questions that perhaps you didn't even think was a question. Uh, and I think that's the kind of role that many of us in this room can play. We come from very different fields. Anastasia, Rohan, you, John Hans, and me, and everyone else. Can we play road support roles for those who are actually leading? And those are the people in the communities. But that's my role. Anastasia, Krishna, and Rohan. Thank you so much for sharing with us about your decisive contributions 
um, to meeting and delivering our common goals as articulated in the United Nations 2030 agenda. And also for ensuring, and I think most importantly, to ensure that no one is dying. Please join me, Anastasia Rawan Krishna, on behalf of the um, World Humanitarian Forum to throw a challenge out there to our global audience and to ask them to please let us know by um, putting their comments in the chat box, what will be your role in this global reset? Thank you so much. Thank you.